In the heart of the 13th century, a cataclysmic wave of conquest reshaped the world of empires. It all began in 1206 when tribal leaders in Mongolia gathered to declare Chinggis Khan as their sovereign. By 1241, the Mongol forces had left a trail of destruction in their wake. They had decimated Kiev, triumphed over Poland, subjugated Hungary, and, under the formidable leadership of Khan Batu, they were closing in on Vienna. In the span of just three and a half decades, Chinggis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, seized the capital of the Song dynasty in China. Empires, kingdoms, and cities all succumbed or surrendered to this seemingly invincible force. For the first, and perhaps the last, time in history, a single family united Eurasia, stretching from China to the Black Sea under their rule. Vienna's fortune was decided by a twist of fate. Bada halted his march when he received news of the death of Great Khan Ogade, Chinggis's successor, returning to Mongolia to select a new leader. Unfortunately, Baghdad wasn't as fortunate. In 1258, Mongols led by Chinggis's grandson, Hulegu, sacked the city, toppling the caliph. The Byzantine ruler of Trebizond, located along the Black Sea, learned from these events. He, along with the Seljuk Turks, agreed to submit himself and his realm to the Mongol emperor. Overwhelmed by the Mongol war machine, surviving rulers began sending emissaries to the courts of Mongol Khans. In just a few decades, the sheltering sky of the Mongol empire beckoned and offered safety and rewards to a diverse array of individuals, including merchants, clerics, scholars, artisans, and officials. The Mongol empires, although not enduring when compared to the likes of Rome or Byzantium, left a lasting legacy in world history through the connections they forged across Eurasia and the imperial technologies they adapted, transformed, and bequeathed to future realms. This chapter delves into the genesis of Mongol power, the remarkable journey of Chinggis Khan, the arsenal of tactics that Mongols wielded, the path of Mongol Khanates, and the far-reaching influence of Mongol empires on global politics and culture. The Romans meticulously built their Mediterranean empire over four centuries, while Chinggis Khan and his descendants orchestrated the rise of a much larger Eurasian empire within a mere seven decades. What kind of society could rise to the challenge of waging long-distance wars and transform the vast expanse of Eurasia, home to numerous scattered peoples, into a web of material and cultural exchange? Paradoxically, nomadic peoples emerged as the masters of rich cities and established civilizations in both China and Central Asia. The economy of pastoral nomadism, along with the political practices of earlier Eurasian empires, equipped the Mongols with a versatile toolkit for empire building. We've previously encountered Eurasian nomads and their impact on the formation, institutions, and vulnerabilities of the Chinese empire. The Xiongnu, for instance, had forced the hand of Han rulers through treaties and tribute payments. The Xiongnu, however, were just one among many nomadic groups orbiting China, breaching its defenses, and negotiating lucrative deals. On the other side of the world, the Romans found themselves compelled to pacify mobile adversaries, known as barbarians, who had migrated westward, often resorting to hiring them as mercenaries. In the 5th century CE, Attila, the renowned leader of the Huns, carved out a colossal realm stretching from the Black Sea deep into Central and Northern Europe. Attila, a masterful diplomat, struck alliances with both Romans and Goths and extracted substantial tribute from the Byzantine Emperor. While Rome was fortunate when Attila abandoned his invasion of Italy in 452, his death a year later was celebrated by his followers as he had terrorized both empires of the Roman world. The Xiongnu, Huns, later the Turks, and the Mongols hailed from a region with a rich history, a vast expanse encompassing the steppes forests, and tundra extending from Finland through Siberia to northern Central Asia and today's China. From the beginning of the first millennium BCE, this region witnessed political tension and innovation as nomads ventured into more hospitable regions while farmers sought to settle on nomadic lands. The Mongols, arriving after their predecessors, had the advantage of learning from the tactics of their forerunners while adding some innovations of their own. This mobile way of life was crucial to survival on the Eurasian steppe, characterized by an expansive rolling plain, interspersed with towering mountains and waterways. The region experienced extreme temperature fluctuations, ranging from minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter to over 100 degrees in the summer. Steppe nomads excelled in allocating scarce resources among widely scattered populations and efficiently moving around with animals that subsisted on the steppe's primary resource, grass. Horses and sheep, among other animals, were central to their way of life. The Przewalski horse, a tough and hardy breed, was capable of digging for grass under snow and covering up to 60 miles in a day. Horses served both as a mode of transportation and a source of milk meat, and leather. She provided nomads with essential resources such as meat, wool for clothing, and materials to construct their portable homes known as yurts. 
Since steppe grass didn't grow quickly enough to support these animals year-round in one location, nomads migrated seasonally, often traveling as far as 100 miles between their summer and winter pastures. The vast Eurasian borderlands held the allure of enticing products for the nomadic way of life. They offered grains to supplement nomadic diets, metals to enhance weapons, and luxurious commodities like tea and silk for personal use or trade. Nomadic empires assimilated the technologies of settled civilizations, including the smelting of iron, and held skilled artisans and craftsmen in high regard. Additionally, controlling and regulating trade along the Silk Road, which connected to China and other distant lands, became another means for gaining access to valuable goods. Throughout history, nomadic and sedentary populations in Eurasia interacted through trade, diplomacy, marriage alliances, and, at times, intense raiding and warfare. The nomads' exceptional military prowess gave them a distinct advantage when push came to shove. Although nomads are often celebrated for their equestrian skills, it was their unique approach to managing people that gave rise to their distinctive style of Eurasian empire. The fundamental unit of steppe society was the family. To thrive, a nomadic family needed not only its own animals but also connections with other groups of people, which could be maintained across vast distances. Over time, these allied families could form themselves into a tribe. While a Eurasian tribe was theoretically composed of individuals descended from a common ancestor, it was open to various forms of joiners. Sworn Brotherhood, or Onda, allowed men to become a brother to a powerful figure from another tribe, while exogamy, or marrying outside one's kinship group, created additional alliances. Such marriages sometimes involved capturing women from other tribes or marrying foreign princesses. Amidst the sweeping landscapes of the Eurasian steppe, loyalties transcended mere blood ties. Whole tribes could willingly submit to others in search of protection or as a consequence of their defeat. Allegiance is solidified through sworn brotherhood, unwavering service, and strategic marriages. Pragmatic alliances among tribal leaders could evolve into powerful super-tribal confederacies. These unions afforded nomadic societies a means to safeguard vital routes and pastures, conduct ruthless campaigns of extortion and plunder against external adversaries, or even conquer them. But the paramount question was, who could rise to command these super-tribal confederacies and marshal them in the pursuit and distribution of resources? Who, in essence, could become an emperor of the steppe? Long before the Mongols emerged as an imperial force, Turkic peoples in Inner Eurasia had already coined their term for the supreme ruler. The Turkic empires, extending from China into Central Asia between 552 and 734 CE, were governed by Kakan. Subsequent powers across Eurasia, such as the Uyghurs in Mongolia, the Khazars in the Caucasus, and the Bulgars along the Volga River, adopted variations of this title, often using Khan. The Khan's authority was envisioned as a divine mandate from Tungri, the chief god of the sky and the nomadic peoples beneath it. However, as we've seen throughout history, divine favor often took multiple interpretations, particularly when choosing an emperor. The Mongols, in continuity with their nomadic predecessors, combined elements of martial prowess and lineage in their system of governance. This system, as described by Joseph Fletcher, shared similarities with Irish practices, known as tanistry. Upon a chief's demise, the contest for leadership involved both sons and brothers who vied to ascend the ranks. The system did not necessarily foster fraternal harmony, as fratricide was not uncommon. Nonetheless, the assumption was straightforward, the most qualified individual within the chief's extended family, in terms of war and diplomacy, should lead, rather than the firstborn son by mere virtue of birthright. At the pinnacle of power, competitions to assume the role of Khan encompassed both combat and negotiations with potential allies and subordinates. Once the outcome became reasonably clear, a grand council, known as a Korotai, would convene to formally declare the new leader. This institution, assembling tribal leaders to produce a momentous and binding decision, continues to find application in regions like Afghanistan and other political spaces across Eurasia. The posthumous conflicts following Akan's death were not crises of succession but rather a customary and rigorous procedure for selecting the most qualified individual. To ascend to the position of Khan, one had to hail from a prominent family, prevail in the pre-leadership competition, and earn the endorsement of other influential leaders. Charisma was both an expectation and an outcome of this system. The exceptional qualities of the Khan and his lineage were interpreted as signs of celestial fortune, referred to as Tin Turkic. 
Similar to other Eurasian nomads, the Mongols believed in a world teeming with spirits that humans could entreat, invoke, and placate. These beliefs seamlessly accommodated diverse religious traditions. Nomadic rulers often extended protection to Christians, including sects that had lost doctrinal conflicts under the Byzantines and Buddhists. Among their spiritual helpers were shamans, individuals with the unique ability to communicate with spirits and seek their assistance. Eurasian peoples had a rich history of creating, challenging, and fragmenting empires. For centuries, China remained an irresistible magnet for competing nomadic and semi-settled groups, enduring fragmentation and reunification following the fall of the Han Dynasty. Turkic Khanates intermittently controlled the lucrative Silk Road, while the Suai and Tang dynasties endeavored to reunify and administer the Chinese Empire. The disintegration of the Khanates in the 8th century C set Turkic groups in motion, pushing them westward toward Byzantium and other imperial prospects. One such confederacy, the Uyghurs, seized the opportunity to assist the Tang dynasty in overcoming their adversaries and reaped considerable rewards, including copious amounts of silk. The Song dynasty, established in 960, oversaw the expansion, transformation, and reorientation of China's economy. Thriving port cities and flourishing trade with Southeast Asia more than compensated for the waning transcontinental trade routes. The Song era witnessed China's population soaring beyond 100 million. However, the Song dynasty, too, found themselves at the mercy of, or in conflict with, another nomadic empire, the Khitans, who zealously safeguarded the Silk Road. This protection was evident in various foreign names for China, such as Katai and Russian and Cathay in European tongues. The Khitans, and later the Jurchens, who hailed from Manchuria, managed to wrest extensive territories from the Song dynasty and established their own dynasties in northern China, the Liao, 916-1121, and the Jin, 1115-1234. The Mongols also originated from the forested regions of Manchuria. They made their way westward, eventually settling in what we now know as Mongolia. Here, Chinggis Khan's ancestors founded their own nomadic tribe, replete with totemic animal ancestors, a blue wolf and a doe, and their sacred mountain, Birkin Khaldun. However, what set the stage for the Mongols' later achievements was the accumulated political wisdom from these and other Eurasian cultures. Undoubtedly, the key to conquest resided in the strength of the military. Both the Khitans and the Jurchens employed ancient institutions, including the Xiongnu's organization of their army in a decimal system and the personal guards of rulers. In these systems, warriors fought in units of ten men, which were then organized into larger formations of hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands. Chinggis Khan refined these decimal-based units by dividing tribal contingents and redistributing warriors across separate units. This structure fostered a sense of responsibility, each soldier was answerable for the conduct of every member in their unit. The nomadic lifestyle offered intrinsic training, children learned to ride horses from a young age, and hunting served as a favorite pastime. Obedience to clan or unit leaders was paramount. Mongol horsemen utilized short stirrups, a design that provided them with speed and mobility. Warriors could ride forward while shooting arrows backward, a scene frequently depicted in art following the Mongols' conquests. The Mongols also employed various tactical strategies, including the art of the famed retreat, drawing the enemy into disarray, bogus camps, and mannequins mounted on horses. The foundation of their military might, however, lay in the double-arched compound bow, an invention consisting of layers of sinew and bone on a wooden frame. In the course of their conquests, the Mongols integrated new weaponry, including armored cavalry with lances, Chinese artillery, and gunpowder. Within the vast steppe landscapes of the early 13th century, the Mongols, a people numbering no more than a few hundred thousand, embarked on a transformational journey under the leadership of Chinggis Khan. By the end of Chinggis Khan's life, around 130,000 Mongols stood united under his banner, constituting a formidable force. This was roughly a third to a quarter the size of the Roman army at its zenith. What was truly astonishing was that this relatively modest population wielded dominion over nearly half of the world's forces during the 13th century. The nomadic lifestyle allowed the entire society to mobilize for war, women followed campaigns, contributing both supplies and even taking up arms beside the men. The concept of returning home was practically non-existent, what was not an end in itself but a means for pillaging, dividing the spoils, and moving forward to acquire more. The Mongols transported their provisions with them and deposited reserves in anticipation of battle. 
they possessed intimate knowledge of where to locate water sources. When isolated from their supply lines, they even resorted to survival foods, including horse blood. Collectively, these attributes rendered Chinggis Khan's army an indomitable and formidable force. Chinggis Khan's journey to power epitomized fundamental aspects of Eurasian political practices and the pivotal role of leadership within a personalized and patrimonial system. He crafted his mystique as he navigated the arduous path to ascendancy, overcoming what appeared to be insurmountable obstacles was construed as evidence of Chinggis's good fortune and contributed to the growth of his legend and cult. Around 1167, a male child named Temujin was born into a chiefly, albeit not influential, family in Mongolia. Temujin's father had established a bond of sworn brotherhood with Toguro, the influential leader of the Karai Confederacy, while Temujin's mother was abducted from yet another clan. At a tender age, Temujin became engaged to a girl named Bort, a member of his mother's tribe. This background appeared unexceptional and held little promise. However, Temujin's fate took a perilous turn when a Tatar tribesman murdered his father, resulting in his family being abandoned by his father's clan. Consequently, Temujin, his mother, and her other children were left to fend for the themselves. Under these inauspicious circumstances, Temujin exhibited a forceful and dynamic personality that garnered him friends, foes, and victims alike. In a tragic altercation, Temujin and one of his brothers killed a third sibling. In 1180, he was captured and narrowly escaped execution at the hands of a clan that had previously been allied with his father. Following this traumatic incident, Temujin used Bor's dowry as an offering and submitted to his father's sworn brother, Togurul. This service to Togurul, an accomplished leader of the steppe, and his interactions with the Turkic-speaking Karaites, who harbored both Christians and Buddhists, equipped Temujin with new resources. He gradually cultivated a following of loyal adherents, known as Nokers, who forsook their tribes to join him. Additionally, he forged a new bond with his childhood friend Jamaica, a man of high status, who came with his own subordinates. These alliances would prove invaluable when Bort was abducted by the Murky tribe. With the support of his allies, including Togrul and Jamaica, Temujin successfully defeated the Merkits, rescued Bort, and exacted brutal vengeance, thereby ascending to the status of a chief. Around 1190, several clan leaders elected Temujin as a Khan. They pledged to obey him in times of both peace and war, as well as to contribute the spoils of their conquest for him to distribute. Temujin embarked on the task of refining the institutions established by his predecessors. He augmented his personal retinue with artisans and cooks, in addition to his closest commanders. Temujin and his former sworn brother, Jamaka, each commanded about 30,000 warriors and emerged as rival chiefs on the steppe. After a significant loss to Jamaica in 1187, Temujin sought refuge in northern China, where he lent his military support to the Jin dynasty and its patron, Toguro. This partnership with the Jin Emperor elevated Toguro to the position of overall Khan and conferred a heightened status upon Temujin. It also exposed Temujin to the practices of the Jurchens and the allure of China's opulence. Upon his return to the steppe as a prominent leader, Temujin resumed his mission to eliminate rivals or incorporate them into his ranks. He skillfully outmaneuvered his former comrade Jamaica and triumphed over the adversaries of his childhood. Nevertheless, when Temujin turned against Toguro, his erstwhile superior and the overall Khan, he was compelled into yet another retreat, this time back to Manchuria. Eventually, he secured victory over Toguro, who perished in battle, and eliminated his sworn brother Jamaica. In a demonstration of ultimate power, Temujin ordered the execution of his shaman. Chinggis Khan was officially proclaimed as the leader of the Mongols at a momentous quarrel tie of steppe leaders in 1206. His chosen title, Chinggis Khan, was reminiscent of the Roman honorific Augustus, marking his distinction from prior overall Khans. Temujin selected a title that alluded to the divine counterpart of Tungri, the sky god. Chinggis represented the spirits that governed the earth. Chinggis Khan now reigned as the lord of the world. Chinggis Khan's life was an extraordinary odyssey through the intricate world of nomadic politics, pushing its boundaries to new limits. His ascent to power was a remarkable transformation, evolving from a humble existence rubbing for roots alongside his outcast mother to ultimately becoming an emperor. He achieved this through astute maneuvering within established nomadic institutions, such as sworn brotherhood, pledged subordination, exogamous marriage, and the intricate web of obligations involving revenge, service, and reward. His journey was marked by a series of shrewd alliances and ruthless assaults. Chinggis Khan was unafraid to bend or break the rules when he possessed the strength to do so, often employing the severance of clan ties as a primary tactical move. In the pursuit of personal, rather than blood-defined, loyalty, he did not hesitate to execute or threaten execution against many of his closest male relatives. 
Following the suppression of rebellious subordinates, he offered protection to their remnant families. Displaying his charismatic leadership, Chinggis proudly proclaimed that he shared the same clothing and ate the same food as the cowherds and horse herders. He stated that he cared for his soldiers as if they were my brothers. This politics of personal loyalty, sustained by ample rewards for unwavering service, demanded that Chinggis extend his reach further. The most alluring and immediate target was China, a land rich with grain, linen, cotton, bronze, copper, mirrors, gold, satin, rice wine, and the ultimate luxury commodity, silk. The 13th century presented a divided and vulnerable Chinese empire, with the Song emperors governing the southern region, fostering trade, urbanization, scientific innovations, engineering feats, including gunpowder, arts, and cultural production, while the Jin dynasty ruled in the north. Yet, Chinggis Khan, in a departure from the strategies of earlier steppe leaders, initially concentrated his efforts on regions within his core domain and powers located along battle trade routes, particularly the lucrative Silk Road. Chinggis dispatched his son Joshi to subdue tribes in Siberia while he personally dealt with the tribes that had assisted Jamaica. Some groups wisely submitted voluntarily, as was the case with the Uyghur Turks. The Uyghur alphabet offered the Mongols a means to document their conquests and Chinggis's regulations. In 1209, Chinggis embarked on a campaign against the Tongu Empire, which was situated between the Mongol heartland and Chinese territory. The Tongu leader surrendered in 1210, sending a massive tribute to secure peace. However, his refusal to dispatch troops to aid the Mongol army would prove to be a grave miscalculation. With his core region consolidated, Chinggis declared war on the Jin dynasty, culminating in the capture of the Jin capital, Dongdu, near present-day Beijing, in 1215. The conquest brought not only tribute but also a Jin bride for Chinggis, marking the full circle of conquering powers that had once sheltered him. Following this triumph in northern China, Chinggis Khan shifted his focus westward. He continued to vanquish challenges and acquire subordinates, including Muslims who welcomed the Mongols' indifference to other religions. Having subjugated the empires of Inner Asia, Chinggis made a diplomatic overture to the prosperous ruler of Krang, a region in the vicinity of present-day Iran. Part of his proposal, aimed at ensuring the security of trade routes for flourishing merchants, went unheeded. Chinggis's envoys and merchants were executed, a grave mistake. In retaliation, Chinggis assembled a colossal army drawn from his conquered territories and descended upon Central Asia in 1219. Cities fell to devastating violence unless their leaders submitted to Mongol rule. Men were systematically executed, while women and children were enslaved. Skilled artisans, highly valued for their expertise, were sent to serve the Mongol courts. Clergy, with their ability to access spirits, were spared, thus diminishing the likelihood of anti-Mongol holy wars. In 1221, Chinggis extended his campaign westward into present-day Iran and Afghanistan, reaching the Indus River. Some Mongol troops ventured into the Caucasus, Ukraine, and along the Volga, traveling approximately 12,500 miles in four years. They defeated Georgians, Kipchak Turks in Ukraine, Rus princes in the Kiev region, and Volga Bulgars. Chinggis, however, remained mindful of his limits and the perils of encirclement. He refrained from advancing further into India and began his journey back to Mongolia, which would mark his final campaign. At this point, Chinggis had secured the position of Earth Emperor and was determined to retain it. He consulted Taoist monks who advised that he could prolong his life if he relinquished certain indulgences such as hunting, licentious behavior, and excessive drinking. While Chinggis had not lived a life of luxury, he was known for his fondness for drinking, a favorite pastime among the Mongols, and had numerous sexual partners. In addition to his senior wife, Port, who remained the most powerful woman in his household, Chinggis had acquired numerous other wives and concubines through diplomacy and conquest. Some of these women were presented to his sons and favored warriors. Mongol trophy wives held the potential to become influential figures in their new homes. The Mongols' practice of multiple marriages outside their own group, coupled with their victorious campaigns, contributed to the widespread presence of their descendants in the world today. Chinggis Khan's life came to a close during a campaign of retribution. In 1226, he embarked on a mission against his old adversaries, the Tongits, who had previously refused to provide him with soldiers. The following year, Chinggis passed away, and Mongol forces carried out the extermination of the entire population of the Tongu city of Zhangsheng in his honor. Chinggis Khan's body was secretly transported back to Mongolia, where he was laid to rest near Birkenkaldun, the sacred mountain he had revered on his path to power. His grave was discreetly camouflaged, and the surrounding area was declared a forbidden, sacred space. Chinggis Khan masterfully harnessed ideologies, institutions, and statecraft developed earlier in Eurasia. His sacred aura, 
forged through the crucible of hardship and the defeat of his rivals, allowed him to reap the rewards of organized, mobile, self-sufficient armies, as well as a dynastic outreach strategy based on inclusive marriage practices. This approach ensured the prosperity, beauty, and security of protected merchants, artisans, and clergy. Scripting enabled the recording of income, distributions, and decrees, while multiple revenue sources, including trade, tribute, war, and taxation, furnished the attributes of statehood without the divisive exclusions associated with monotheism. From an institutional standpoint, 13th century Eurasia offered the building blocks of empire that were conspicuously absent in Europe at that time. Nevertheless, it took an extraordinary individual to unite or subjugate tribes, cities, confederacies, and other empires under a single polity, all governed by the Great Khan. How could the aftermath of violent conquest lead to a period described as the Mongol peace in the late 13th century? It might seem paradoxical, considering that Genghis Khan's proposed flourishing trade with the Shah of Krem had indeed taken place across Eurasia. However, the expansion of economic connections was predominantly driven by force, markets don't naturally become global. Nevertheless, for those who survived the initial devastations unleashed by the Mongols, the conquest brought about opportunities for commercial and cultural expansion. Much like the Roman expansion of their empire, the Mongol conquest also opened up new political possibilities and imaginative horizons both on the steppe and beyond. For the Mongol rulers, their officials, and other subordinates, this era of peace provided the chance to synthesize various repertoires of rule that would profoundly influence subsequent empires. Yet, to attain this peace, there had to be a pivotal period of stabilization. After Chinggis's death, the viability of a transcontinental empire hinged on Mongol leaders establishing stability among themselves. Recognizing the potential for conflict inherent in the Mongol system of Tanistry, Chinggis had already designated his third son, Ogede, as his successor and ensured that his other sons supported this choice in writing. In 1229, following a period of power struggles, the prominent descendants and officials of Chinggis convened a colossal coral tie during which they confirmed Ogade as the Great Khan. Members of Chinggis's family, including his sons, surviving brothers, and at least one daughter, were assigned territories, or Ellis's, to rule. The Great Khan retained his coordinating authority over the entire empire. In accordance with the realist tradition of Eurasian politics, the eldest son was usually assigned pastures that were farthest from his father's domains. During Chinggis's time, this meant extending as far west as the Mongol who had trodden, a fateful allocation for the peoples of Eastern Europe. The western steppes, west of the Volga River, became part of the Ullis assigned to Chinggis's oldest son, Joshi, which was later inherited by Joshi's son, Bata. Chinggis's second son received lands in Central Asia, while the youngest son, Tolu, inherited the heartland of Mongolia. Great Khan Ogade initiated the construction of walls and palaces for a new Mongol capital at Karakoram, the place Chinggis, with his legendary luck, had once visited. This period of uneasy unity among Chinggis's closest descendants persisted into the middle of the 13th century, affording the empire sufficient time to evolve into a truly transcontinental entity. The second phase of Mongol expansion was marked by the use of a combination of terror and diplomacy, similar to the tactics used during the initial conquests. To the east, the Mongols continued their campaign against the Jin dynasty, eventually completing the conquest of northern China by 1234. They annexed parts of Tibet around 1,200. 50, thanks to cultivated relationships with ambitious Buddhist Lamas. However, the campaign to conquer southern China under the Song dynasty presented a formidable challenge. After extensive preparations aided by Chinese advisors, Genghis's grandson Kublai Khan ultimately vanquished the Song in 1279 and established the Yuan dynasty. The Mongols made several attempts to conquer Japan, all of which ended in failure, marking their limits in the east. On the other side of the world, the boundaries of ambition were less distinct. In 1236, Chinggis's grandson Bada led his Mongol army west of the Urals. In five years, these forces had extended as far as Ukraine, Poland, and Hungary. As previously discussed, the Mongol expansion ceased when Bata returned to Mongolia following the death of Great Khan Ogade. Later, Bata established himself in the steppe region of his Ellis, where he enjoyed access to grasslands and connections to the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Volga River, and transcontinental trade. 
he named his realm the Kipchak Khanate, recalling the Turkic-speaking Kipchaks who had previously controlled this region but were now subject to the Mongols' formidable power. This Khanate later became known as the Golden Horde. In between China and the Golden Horde, the Mongols solidified their control over the two other regions allocated to Chinggis' successors. In 1251, Munka, who had been elected Great Khan, ordered his brother Hulegu to finalize Chinggis' conquest of Southwest Asia. Hulegu defeated the Shiite Ismailis and then turned his attention to the Abbasids. He laid siege to Baghdad, captured the city, and put the caliph and an estimated 200,000 city residents to the sword. Hulegu's advances were finally halted as he approached Egypt by the Mamluk Sultan's forces. He established the Il Khan's dynasty, centered in Iraq and Persia. The fourth Ellis, governed by Chinggis' second son Shagatai, extended eastward from the Aral Sea, encompassing the trade route cities of Krem and linking the other three Mongol realms, the Il Khans, the Golden Horde, and Yuan China, with each other. One source of the Mongol peace was undoubtedly more war, war that drew most of Eurasia under the dominion of one or another of the Chinggisid rulers. However, another source was diplomacy. Wise rulers, such as the Armenians, and aspiring leaders, like the Rus princes near Moscow, learned that submitting to the Mongol Khans could bring protection and, for some, great wealth. As for the inner circle, the Mongol imperial family managed to divide control over their realm and rule for over four decades. Each succession of a great Khan was preceded by a period during which the Chinggisids maneuvered and schemed against each other, effectively practicing tanistry on a grand scale. Nonetheless, the Ullis principle offered an alternative to all-out war. Four Chinggisid dynasties emerged from the conquests, the Golden Horde, under the descendants of Joshi, with its capital in Sarai on the Volga, the neighboring Shagatai Khanate, situated roughly in modern-day Uzbekistan, the Ilkhans in Persia, ruled by the descendants of Hulegu, and the Yuan dynasty in China, led from 1260 to 1294 by the well-remembered Kublai. The sons of Ogade, the first great Khan after Chinggis, failed in their succession struggles and eventually lost all of their territories. The more successful descendants of Chinggis' son Toli, Hulegu and Kublai, ended up governing two of the four major Khanates. By 1260, it had become accurate to speak of Mongol empires in the plural. When Great Khan Munka passed away in 1259, Kublai, who was situated in China, did not wait for a quarrel type but simply proclaimed himself as the sovereign by the support of his troops. Kublai established his own capital at a place he named the City of the Khan, or Khan Bali, later known as Beijing. In each of the Khanates, Mongol rulers drew strength from Eurasian political principles while continuing to adopt management strategies from the conquered lands. The Mongol way of rule, rather than a single formal empire, encouraged connections between the East and the West, reshaped culture, demographics, statecraft, and commerce, and inspired new aspirations in a broadening world. As the Mongol Empire shifted from conquest to governance, the need for a new approach became evident. Great Khan Ogade astutely remarked, the empire was created on horseback, but it cannot be governed on horseback. This statement was likely influenced by the wisdom of Chinese advisors, who had more experience with the challenges of governance. As the Mongols transitioned into rulers, they embraced local intermediaries and developed strategies for controlling them. Their sovereignty in the various Khanates was marked by adaptability to local circumstances, including religion, art, science, and comforts, while also preserving key elements of Eurasian power dynamics. In China, a unique transformation was necessary. The Mongol conquests united the north and south of China, extending the country's boundaries to unprecedented proportions. Kublai, a far-sighted ruler who had already enlisted Chinese advisors, harnessed the venerable imperial tradition to emphasize his status as a universal ruler. He chose the name Yuan for his dynasty, meaning origin of the cosmos. This name diverted attention from the fact that the Mongols did not originate from Chinese territory. In 1272, Kublai proclaimed his emperorship through an imposing edict, offering Chinese scholars a basis to claim that the Yuan dynasty had legitimately inherited the mandate of heaven and would bring glory to it. Across the empire, the Mongols adapted or transformed institutions as needed, preserving the position of the Khan and his command. They also employed an expandable system of rule, registration. This was essential for effectively taxing their subjects. Before their conquests, Uyghur advisors had introduced the Mongols to writing and secretarial expertise. In China, Great Khan Munka ordered the largest census ever conducted in 1252. The decimal system used to organize the Mongol armies was applied to count the populations and conscript soldiers. In regions like the Rus lands, officials were given titles corresponding to their roles, such as leaders of hundreds and ten thousands. The Mongols employed various taxes, such as those on individuals, trade, and herds, and tailored their tax collection 
production methods to different parts of the empire, dealing with the risk that local authorities might break away from subordination and become overlords, the Mongols devised a strategic response to the double-edged sword of indirect rule. They reserved military ranks mostly for Mongols, while positions in the civilian bureaucracy were open to people from various backgrounds, and those in official roles were tied to higher authorities through personal connections. This system allowed the Mongols to utilize knowledgeable individuals from different areas without relinquishing too much power. Managing intermediaries involved shifting them around the empire and adjusting their administrative practices to suit local needs. After Chinggis's initial assaults in Iran, Persians, Uyghurs, Mongol sub-tribal leaders, and Jews were appointed as high officials. Under the Ilkhans, much of the administration returned to the hands of ancient Persian families. In China, the Mongols were cautious about relying on Chinese intermediaries with their well-established administrative traditions. They left lower-level officials in charge of local tax collection while engaging foreigners, such as Muslims, Uyghurs, and members of Mongol sub-tribes, as top administrators. This policy may have indirectly encouraged Chinese elites to invest more in arts and literature. As a demonstration of their power, the examination system for entry into the Chinese civil service was temporarily suspended. At the highest level of politics, the Mongol empires adhered to Eurasian dynastic principles. The emperor, or Khan, had to be a Chinggisid, a descendant of Chinggis Khan's family. However, individuals serving the dynasty were not bound by this rule. The government apparatus was open to individuals from diverse backgrounds and religions who could compete with each other to be the most useful to their rulers. Despite their seemingly indifferent stance toward religion during their conquests, the Mongol leaders demonstrated a different approach compared to Byzantine, Islamic, and Carolingian imperial rulers. What some Europeans later interpreted as Mongol tolerance of multiple religions derived from unique conditions. These conditions included the Eurasians' interest in spiritual advisors, the diversity of faiths on the territories they conquered, and the pragmatic politics of forming alliances through exogamous marriages. For instance, Chinggis arranged for his son Towi to marry a niece of the Ong Khan. This woman, Sir Hoktani, belonged to a Christian group known as Nestorians. Under the Ilkhans in the early years of Mongol rule, various religions, including Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam, thrived. Over time, many Mongols converted to different religions. The better known conversion was to Islam, particularly in the area where the Abbasid Caliphate had been destroyed. Within a generation, Mongol rulers in Persia had converted to Islam fostering a flourishing Islamic culture under the Ilkhans and their successors. Law was an integral part of the Mongol way of governance. During his ascent to power, Chinggis adopted regulatory practices from literate servitors and captives, introducing a record-keeping system to document the lands and peoples assigned to subordinates. Chinggis's orders were also to be written down and preserved. Although no text of the law code known as Chinggis's Great Yasa has survived, law played various roles in governance, encompassing a set of rules, the process of making judgments, and the involvement of courts and jurists. Mongol Khans issued laws and facilitated lawful judgments, with the Khan acting as the dispenser of justice, guided by the council of religious or tribal authorities. Many legal judgments in Mongol lands were delivered directly by these authorities, expected to resolve conflicts within their subordinated groups. The Mongols were willing to devolve authority to punish crimes that did not directly concern the state, and they were open to treaty-making practices and negotiations for terms of subordination, surrender, and exchange, grounded in declared loyalty and contractual arrangements. The Mongol way was not just a physical empire, but a vast trade route that crisscrossed Eurasia, connecting khans, officials, merchants, travelers, and their exchange partners. It transformed the famous Silk Road into a thriving media highway. Great Khan Ogadeh introduced the Yam system in 1234, a network of way stations located every 25 to 30 miles, each designed to accommodate the daily travel distance of horses with their loads. These stations provided horses and supplies for authorized users, including diplomatic envoys, imperial couriers, and merchants. Travelers carried a medallion inscribed in Mongolian as evidence of their sanctioned passage. This paizi, a Chinese word, was the precursor to modern passport systems. The Yam system served a dual purpose, allowing for control and taxation of merchants while enabling official messengers to change horses and cover about 200 miles a day. The Mongols had taken a courier service previously used in northern China by the Khitans and expanded it into a transcontinental network of control, taxation, and exchange. The Mongol connection spanned from the Pacific to the Mediterranean and the Baltic, 
fostering the exchange of knowledge, ideas, and techniques across vast distances. Buddhists in Persia, Muslim advisors in China, and far-flung Christian missions were part of this great mixing of cultures and religions in the 13th and 14th centuries. Even where people didn't physically move, their diets, culinary traditions, medical knowledge, geographic understanding, and artistic environments were transformed by contact and travel across the continent. For example, Mongol elites who once consumed meat broth with fermented mare's milk at a great quarrel in 1246 transitioned to a more diverse diet a century later, featuring wheat bread, pasta, chickpeas, nuts, eggplants, honey, and syrups. Their beloved mutton now came seasoned with spices, marinated, roasted, and served with hummus. This culinary exchange saw the Middle Eastern cuisine journey to Asia, along with the culinary experts who brought their recipes. Medical systems also experienced this mutual exchange. The Mongol way provided access to various medical traditions, including Chinese, Korean, Tibetan, Muslim, and Nestorian Christian practices. Chinese physicians during the Ilkhan's rule promoted acupuncture, herbal pastes, mercury applications, and pulse taking for diagnosis. Conversely, the Yuan Imperial Library catalog in 1273 listed Ibn Sina's Avicenna, Canon on Medicine, produced in Central Asia in the early 11th century. However, the exchange of knowledge wasn't always benevolent, as diseases transited the steppe, resulting in great plagues in China and the Black Death in Europe during the mid-14th century. Eager to explore the earth and the sky, the Mongols invested in map-making and astronomy. The Yuan dynasty established a geographical academy staffed by Muslim cartographers. These specialists in the 14th century possessed a more accurate knowledge of Africa and the Mediterranean than Europeans had of Asia. The Ilkhans, during the second half of the 13th century, initiated a building boom that adorned their cities with domes embellished with glazed tile mosaics, synthesizing Persian, Chinese, and Turkic motifs. The era also witnessed the flourishing of manuscript illustration and calligraphy. Carpets, an art form initially invented by nomads, underwent further development and spread across Asia. The common factor behind this explosion in artistic production was wealth, patronage, and the blending of artistic traditions, as Mongol rulers attracted the most talented artists, artisans, and scholars to their courts. This cultural explosion was rooted in the economic expansion fostered by the Mongol peace. Mongol investment in commercial activities, the maintenance of a high-speed transit and communication system across Eurasia, protection for merchants and artisans, and dispute resolution practices broadened the horizons of long-distance trade. In contrast to China's ambivalence toward merchants, the Mongols established institutions that facilitated long-distance trade and local productivity, including a form of partnership between the state and individual entrepreneurs. Venetian and Genoa merchants, along with officials in black seaports, reaped the benefits of the Mongols' pro-merchant, cosmopolitan, rights-granting policies, connecting Eurasian commerce with the eastern Mediterranean. The Mongols also preserved religious institutions, embraced various cultural regimes and social groups within their territories, and promoted trade and cultural exchange. This environment led scholars of the time to believe that a comprehensive account of the history of the world and its diverse human species was finally attainable. Rashid Alden wrote in his collected chronicles completed around 1310 that it was only under Mongol rule that it became possible to create a general account of the history of the inhabitants of the world and different human species. His ambition was to study the manuscripts and wisdom of various peoples, including biblical prophets, Muhammad, the Caliphates, Mongols, Turks, Chinese, Jews, Indians, and Franks, assembling a diverse range of histories. Rashid Alden's perspective viewed humanity as a composite, a world composed of different peoples, each with its knowledge, beliefs, scholars, and sources. The imperial imagination of the Mongols, envisioning a connected and diverse world, united scholars like Rashid Alden and knowledge specialists. The unifying force behind this diverse tapestry was the protection and patronage of the Mongol Khans. The Mongol connections had far-reaching effects on the political, economic, and cultural landscapes of the world long after the Mongol empires themselves had faded away. However, the coordinated system under a recognizable dynasty lasted only a few decades, ultimately giving way to a dramatic breakdown. The empire's very success, dependent on resource distribution to warriors and followers, necessitated expansion. Shifting allegiances had been pivotal to Chinggis's rise, but they could also lead to the empire's fragmentation. The establishment of separate illnesses, or territories, helped delay the end of the empire. 
However, as Mongol leaders settled in their respective areas, they lost the tactical advantages that once set them apart from rivals, diminishing their motivation for unity. Internal strife among the Mongol Khanates became as pressing as external conflicts. The first to fall was the most settled of the four Khanates, the Ilkhans. Ruling from 1256 to 1335, they found themselves caught between two formidable military powers, the Mamluks in Egypt and the Golden Horde's Mongols. A strategic alliance between the Mamluks and the Golden Horde for lucrative trade routes through the Black Sea and Constantinople to Egypt left the Ilkhans, who had converted to Islam, with only marginal success in forming alliances with various Franks. The dynasty eventually disintegrated due to a lack of clear successors, and its territory fragmented for 40 years, with many Mongols assimilating into local Turkic-speaking, Muslim tribes. The Yuan dynasty, on the other hand, managed to endure for 30 more years. However, the Mongol descendants of Kublai Khan faced threats from various directions, Mongol warlords in the north and peasant uprisings, as well as Buddhist revolts in the south. The last Yuan ruler, Togen Temur, was overthrown by a Chinese renegade who established the non-Mongol Ming dynasty. In contrast, the two Khanates located in the heart of Eurasia, far from its contested borders, charted more durable paths. The Golden Horde, known as the Kipchak Khanate, arrived under Bata, Chinggis's grandson. It was situated in ideal terrain for horse raising and trade, not far from future Russia, where a host of princes vied for power. The Khanate's capitals along the Volga River became immensely prosperous. The Horde eventually became a Muslim power under Uzbek Khan but, in adherence to the principle that had united it, fragmented as ambitious leaders formed new coalitions, even aligning with the Ottoman Turks to attack the Horde. The Golden Horde broke into separate Khanates along the Volga and the Black Sea steppes, which were subsequently incorporated into other empires over the next 350 years. Shagatai's Ullis in Central Asia divided into Transoxiana and Mughalistan by the late 13th century and eventually dissolved into loose confederations of tribal and military units, each loosely connected to urban and agricultural regions. This region, where pastoralism and rough alliances were deeply ingrained, gave rise to the last great Mongol conqueror, Tamerlane. Tamerlane, a Mongol by descent, a Muslim by birth, and a Turkic speaker, followed in Chinggis's footsteps, rising to great power through ruthless conquest. His mastery lay in skillfully aligning with men from different tribes, former foes, and external aggressors to vanquish rivals and patrons within his own tribe and beyond. Tamerlane personally ruled the Ullis of Shagatai and established a magnificent capital in Samarkand. He ruthlessly subjugated vast territories, including Persia, Afghanistan, the Caucasus, Golden Horde territories, and northern India. His forces captured Baghdad, looted Sarai, and sacked Delhi. In 1402, Tamerlane defeated the Ottomans in Anatolia, effectively ending the career of the great Ottoman conqueror Bayezid. European monarchs praised his victory, and Tamerlane even set out to conquer China, though he perished on the way in 1405. Tamerlane, while keen on associating himself with Chinggis Khan's legacy, was not actually of Chinggis lineage. This posed a challenge to his rule, given the strong dynastic tradition established by the Mongols. To address this issue, Tamerlane placed a nominal Chinggisid at the head of the Ullis of Shagatai. He also married a Chinggisid woman to ensure the birth of royal sons, thus producing many claimants to the Chinggisid lineage across Central and South Asia. Notably, one of Tamerlane's Chinggisid descendants, Babur, would go on to establish the Mughal Empire in India in 1525. Yet, royal lineage alone proved insufficient to maintain Tamerlane's vast empire. Tamerlane designated one of his grandsons as his successor, but his realm immediately fractured into numerous regions. For 15 years, rival factions engaged in bitter warfare. Tamerlane, like Chinggis Khan, had surrounded himself with army commanders from diverse tribes and areas, using the spoils of conquest to sustain his war machine. He further advanced the Mongol strategy of dual governance, combining local administrators and Mongol military commanders. He achieved this by relocating tribal leaders away from their home territories and merging troops from different regions into mixed forces under new leaders. Tamerlane also maintained personal control over the appointment of both civilian and military authorities. While this ultra-personalization of authority proved effective for Tamerlane, it hindered any subsequent leader's ability to mobilize and reward followers. The region returned to a landscape of fluid politics marked by shifting alliances and rivalries among multiple chiefs. Afghanistan, in particular, has presented management challenges for empires to this day. However, what endured after Tamerlane was the mystique of a personal empire led by an all-powerful ruler, passed down through memories of both his devastating violence and the subsequent order he managed to impose. The Mongols left an enduring legacy in Central Asia and its surrounding regions. Regions. They introduced the concept of a far-reaching imperial peace, maintained by a mighty sovereign. 
The idea of a great Khan, a conquering ruler from distant lands rather than a local sun, resonated with the widely dispersed populations of the steppe, desert, and mountainous regions. Following their victories, Mongol rulers allowed people to continue their religious practices and relied on local authorities for governance. The adoption of Islam by some Mongol Khans facilitated a symbiosis between Chinggisid rulership and Persian-influenced urban-based artistic and literary culture. The skills and designs of craftsmen and architects were carried into other areas as Mongol power waned. While the Mongol empires fragmented relatively quickly, their legacy persisted in later political entities. The Mongols' approach to governing, characterized by recognizing and accommodating differences without a fixed center or core population, the cultivation of personalized loyalty as a means of control, fluid politics based on contingent allegiance, pragmatic subordination, and treaty making, remained relevant long after Chinggis's empire fell apart. The transformation extended beyond Eurasia as well. Some inheritors of the Mongol legacy successfully created or rebuilt large and enduring empires, such as the Ottoman, Russian, and Chinese empires. In India, the Muslim Mughals, descendants of Tamerlane, governed a diverse population for over 250 years, fostering commercial connections without imposing their religion. Trade and communication, overseen by the Mongols, opened new horizons for rulers, merchants, and explorers. In 1492, after studying Marco Polo's account of his transcontinental travels from two centuries earlier, Christopher Columbus embarked on his voyage to the land of the Great Khan. 